All right, you guys. So, chapter 32, an overview of animal diversity. All right. So, there are 1.3 million species. SPP, remember, is species plural. Literally, that's what the second P stands for. Grab my little stencil here. Um, of extant living animals that have been identified. Um, animals cannot make all their own food, right? They are uh, heterotrophic. Uh, they must ingest food. They can't absorb it like fungus, so they are their own kingdom. The cell structure, they're obviously eukaryotic. They're very much multicellular, but they do not have any cell walls, okay? That's where they differ from plants and animals again. Instead, they've got proteins that are on the outside of the cell membrane, and that's what's going to provide a structural support. So instead of having cell walls for support, cell wall made of cellulose for plants and chitin for fungi, they're not going to have a cell wall. They're going to just have a lot of proteins in their cell membrane. You've got two types of cells that are not found in other multicellular organisms, and that's nerve and muscle cells, all right? Nice, beautiful nerve cell right there, and that is, oh, good Lord, I don't know, maybe 200, 250 cells. And muscle cells in each one of those circles in the middle is a nucleus. Reproduction development. Most animals are uh, uh, reproduced sexually, and they'll have the diploid state being dominant. Remember, diploid 2N. Sperm and egg are produced by meiosis, and they come together and form the diploid zygote. And obviously, sperm and egg would be um, haploid, half the DNA, right? Diploid double, N, N and N. Diploid would be 2N. So haploid N, diploid 2N. After fertilization, the zygote is going to undergo a cleavage. I've got these really these three videos right here. I'm hoping they still work. Um, they are so freaking cool. They show the actual gastrulation process. Um, it goes way more depth than what we go into, but it's really cool to see this process um, computerized. After fertilization, the uh, zygote undergoes cleavage because that's great. So it's a fertilized egg. It's a diploid egg, but it's going to have to go through mitosis, right? Divide, become an eight cell stage, and it's going to go through even more and more division, become a blastula, blastula ball of cells, hollow ball of cells. The hollow that's inside is called the blastocele. And then it's going to pinch inwards on itself and form the gastrula, okay? And when it starts to pinch inwards, that's called gastrulation. Um, that's pretty much everything that's right there. Now, some animals will develop straight into adults. Some will have our larval stage. We obviously develop straight into adults, right? We go straight in. Um, but if you're looking at frogs, if you're looking at uh, caterpillars, it becomes uh, butterflies or moths, which is a great time to do this, by the way, if you um, kind of don't have much to do and you don't know what to do. Get yourself some, kind of, some uh, caterpillars, turn them into butterflies. My um, daughter's uh, first grade teacher is doing that right now. And I used to do that and it's a lot of fun. So, just a thought. Anyways, larvae typically eat different uh, and uh, have different habitat than the actual adult form. They'll go through metamorphosis. Now, here's something that's super important with animals. It's the Hox genes, or homeoboxes. They're important in animal embryos, controlling the gene expression that will lead to morphology. Sponges do not have these, um, but they have something that is quite similar. Common ancestor of animals lived about 800 to 7, 675 million years ago, um, looking at some kind of protist-like organism, and here you've got some of the organisms. And uh, what I like is that I'm trying to show you like the change, the evolution of animals through the different eras. So this is the Neoproterozoic era, about 1 billion to 542 million years ago. Uh, Soft-bodied multicellular organisms, so hard to get a lot of specimens from these guys because obviously they would not fossilize well normally. But we have a few. The Paleozoic era, uh, that's really the Cambrian explosion that occurred then. The first arthropod, that's your insects, your crabs. This is a trilobite. This is where I would be showing you guys my beautiful trilobites. And I can't, because they're in the classroom. Anyways, that's okay. We'll get through it. Chordates. So we're starting to get, that's, the, that's that connection between the um, invertebrates to the vertebrates. Okay, that's your lancelets. That's really, that's the key factor. And the echinoderms, that's your sea urchins, your starfish, your sand dollars, your sea biscuits. Those are all echinoderms. So the thought was, is it because there was more oxygen, which led to more competition, which led to natural selection, the Hox gene being present allowed for easier evolution of body parts. That's the theory that scientists have right now. 
Um, then obviously we went from the Cambrian to the Artifician, the Silurian, the Novian, Devonian, apologies. Uh, that's where really lots of animal diversity and episodes of mass extinction occurred. We are in the six, six sorry, mass extinction, so scientists believe. Uh, vertebrates are the top predators in the marine food web, without a doubt. 460 million years ago, groups that impacted the Cambrian make impact on land. So again, all life on Earth started in the water and then moved on to land. So if there's organisms in the water, they had to go from land back into the water, okay? Vertebrates moved to land 365 million years ago and split into many different groups. That's when we started having the amphibians, the annuals, which was the beginning of the uh, te tetrapods, so organisms with four limbs, right? Your reptiles, your birds, your mammals, that's really when it occurred. Mesozoic era, that's when we had our first coral reefs, uh, dinosaurs, and our first mammal. So you see this guy right here? If you ever get a chance to go to the Smithsonian in DC, um, they actually have it, and I got a picture, and I will see if I can find it. It was like in the middle of all these towers of just columns of all these different animals, and then there was a replica of him out of bronze, I want to say. Y'all, the mammal was this big. That big. That's it. That's as big as it was. Um, with the tail. Really small. Really cool. Um, it was a tiny nocturnal insect um, eating uh, organism because it was more, had more safety coming out at night. Um, so evolutionarily survived better. Angiosperms, that's when our flowering plants really took off. Insects had dramatic diversification. So because all the plants took off, the insects took off, all of it went together. Cenozoic era, that's 365.5 million years ago, sorry, 65.5, not 300, 65.5 million years ago to present. Mass extinction led to this era. The rise of large mammalian herbivores and predatory mammals occurred. Global climate started to cool down. Uh, so we came in the picture. And then primates moved out of the woods into grasslands and led to the ancestors of man being there. Okay, gas relation has not changed in 500 million years. Symmetry, radial symmetry. So if I can take an organism and I can cut them down in the middle in multiple ways and get two perfect halves of the organism, that is what we call radial symmetry. So think of like a flower pot, right? So obviously an enemy would have radial symmetry. Bilateral symmetry is where there's really only one way to cut an organism in half and have two perfect halves, excluding internal organs. So think of your body. If you cut yourself at the belly, would the top and the bottom match? No, but if you cut yourself from your head down to your toes, smack dab in the middle of your face, start in the middle of your face all the way down, would you have two halves? Yes. So that is bilateral symmetry, okay? And asymmetry is where you have no symmetry whatsoever and that's sponges, <laughs> okay? Um, organisms that have bilateral symmetry, they tend to um, be more active. They'll have a front, okay? Anterior, your top. The back, the posterior, the tush. Yeah, see, for us it's kind of hard. So if you think of a dog, let's do a dog, okay? So anterior is the front, posterior is the back, this took us, okay? The top, where his back is exposed, where his spine is, that would be the dorsal end, and his belly would be the ventral end. Um, and that one, again, kind of always is kind of easy because for me, um, ventre in French means stomach. So ventral ventre, Latin roots, you see it back. And I don't know what it is for, or actually I used to know, I don't remember anymore for Spanish. My gut is, it's pretty close. These guys are much more active. Organisms that have radial symmetry are sessile. They stay attached to one spot uh, or they drift, okay? And both have been present for 550 million years. And then cephalization occurred. That's really the evolution of a brain, all right? You can kind of see down here, cnidarians, radial symmetry, flatworms, bilateral. Um, echinoderms are a little funky. Uh, they have a larval stage where it's bilateral and then they become radial because there's several different ways you can get two halves. Uh, vertebrates obviously have uh, bilateral symmetry, tunicates. Um, asymmetry, I'm almost certain. Sponges, definitely asymmetry. Nematodes, arthropods, um, bilateral. All right, tissues. One, two, three, four. Six more slides and we're done. Sponges and others uh, lack true tissue, but gas relation still leads to layers of concentric cells called germ layers. 
And then you've got three sets of germ layers. You've got the ectoderm, the endoderm, and in the middle, the mesoderm. So the ectoderm, ectoderm, apologies, that's what's going to become your tissue and your organs. The endoderm, that's the inside, that's your digestive system. That's how I kind of think of it. And then your mesoderm, that's what fills in between. So that's going to be your muscles, okay? Organisms with both these, both ectoderm and endoderm. So not all organisms have all three layers. Some just have two. Some will just have the ecto and the endoderms. Those are called diploblasts. So that's your cnidarians. Cnidarians are your jellyfish, um, your uh, corals, and your anemones. Mesoderm, if you've got all three, ecto, endo, and meso, that's us. Your triploblastic, that's everything from flatworms to humans. All right? Body cavity. All right, so this is where it gets quite interesting. Not all organisms have a true body cavity. So what is a body cavity? You've got fluid or air-filled space between digestive tract and the outer body wall. That's known as your coelom. Okay, that means your body cavity, your coelom. There's three forms. a mate, you got no body cavity. Okay? pseudo mate, you got a fake one. You don't have a true separation. And then coelomate, you got a true coelom, a true body cavity. So right here you can see... Right? There's the uh, endoderm, the mesoderm, the ectoderm, right? So that's the food. That's where the digestive tract is. So there's no separation between the three germ layers. They're all attached. Pseudocelomate, all right, they kind of do have a, ca a cavity, but it's not properly separated. You can see, like, there's these little gaps in between right here. Whereas the coelomate right here, it's a true separation. There's a true separation between this, this part and that part of the mesoderm. It's truly separated, okay? Here it's not, okay? Um, coelom uh, cushions the organs, allows internal organs to grow and move independent from the outer body wall. You don't want every time you stretch, stretch out your arm, your heart to move, right? You kind of want to stay in one place. That's kind of a big deal. All right, now here's something else that's fun. Protostome. When... You have that gastrulation occur. Get back to that gastrulation picture. When gastrulation occur, that is forming the digestive tract. Okay? That gastrulation can either form first the mouth or the anus first. And then the opening keeps going. And then up here would be the opposite. So if this forms the mouth first, then this would be the anus. If this forms the anus first, then this would be the mouth. Right? Makes sense? Okay. <laughs> so, protostomes, organisms that have protostomes have what we call a spiral cleavage. That means that that first layer, that first layer of cells, those first four, are 90 degrees from the top layer of four cells. So this is when the, when the, you've got the fertilized egg and divided, divided, and divided, and you have eight cells now. If when the division occurred and the cells separated, if they shifted 90 degrees, Okay, then that is a spiral cleavage. All right. Now, determinate cleavage, the cells isolated will not become a whole animal. So let's say one of these cells breaks off, that organism will not survive. Okay. Deuterostome. So this is more primitive evolutionarily speaking. Deuterostomes. Deuterostomes, doo doo first. Protostome, mouth first. So. The opening from the gastrulation was the mouth. The first opening was the mouth. In deuterostomes, doo-doo, but first. The first opening produced of the digestive tract was the anus. And guess what we are? We are deuterostomes. So we all formed, but first. Yay! Fun times. Okay, these guys are radial cleavage. Radial cleavage. Radial cleavage means that they are perfectly lined up with the rope beneath them. Here's what's interesting. They have indeterminate cleavage. So one of these cells right here can break off and separate and form a completely separate individual. Huh. That would be what we would call an identical twin. Okay? So, fun times. Seal formation, archaneron, um, embryo to digestive tube initially forms this blind pouch. Don't, don't get overwhelmed by these words, okay? So, deuterostomes, doo-doo first, butt first. Protostomes, mouth first. Um, 
indeterminate cleavage, radial for deuterostomes, protostomes, spiral, and indeterminate. You definitely want to know this chart. Uh, the fate of the blastopore, that's mouth and anus first. That's the opening. Is it, which one is it? It's a mouth or is it an anus? Mouth, protostome, anus, deuterostome. Um, that's it. Woohoo! Points of agreement. All animals share a common ancestor. They are monophyletic. The clad is actually called metazoa. And the K-ring explosion uh, is re really mainly led to bilaterians, i.e. bilateral symmetry. And then you've got morphological phylogeny and then molecular phylogeny. So this is how the ancestry has changed um, thanks to use of DNA, amino acids, fatty acids, you kind of name it. We've really, scientists have really been able to go back through and realize that some of our um, thought processes were off as far as the evolution of animals. All right, guys, that's it for this chapter.